pick up at local grocery stores and bring the food back to the pantry and stock it on the shelves. Today we went to uh, Aldi and first time, and thanks to their generosity, we got uh, a lot of good stuff. checking in food items that people have donated and we're stocking the shelves. If we can, we get it all on the shelves, otherwise we do have a stock room to put stuff in, but as soon as it comes in, it's going right out the door. Every family gets a certain amount of groceries, usually two bags and then some extras frozen, some fresh stuff, maybe some milk, maybe some diapers, and depends on what we have every, every day. Our approach is, hey, we love to pray for people, but we don't force anybody to pray. Most of the time, people want to pray, and then we'll say, is there something specific we might pray for? And sometimes we'll find out a little bit more about the family, whether it be a child or another family member who has some sort of an illness, so we can pray specifically yes. for those needs as well. That's only possible because God has moved in so many of you to be generous. Praise God and thank you. When I was a little girl, we lived on a farm in Oklahoma. And about this time of year in Oklahoma, the wheat is normally up probably about this high. And it's just right for an egg hunt. So every year, my folks would dye hundreds of eggs and they would hide beautiful colored eggs out on that wheat field and we would hunt. And every year we knew that there was one prize egg. And normally that prize egg had a $5 bill inside. So I have always loved Easter and especially an Easter surprise. But let's face it, in general, the real celebration of Easter, that Jesus is alive, isn't much of a surprise. We've all heard the story many, many times every year, right? But that very first Easter was a giant surprise to all of Jesus' friends. They went into that day really sad. They may have thought it was over, really. Their leader, their friend that they had been with, had died. I'm sure some of them even thought he wasn't who they thought he was or who they had hoped he would be. But on that first Easter morning, when three women went to the tomb, Man, they had lots of surprises in store. First, they found the stone that was in front of the tomb rolled away. And when they looked inside, there was an angel there and he told them, Jesus isn't here. Remember, he told you that he wouldn't stay here. He is alive. When Jesus' disciples heard the news, they were so surprised they didn't believe it. They had to run and see for themselves. Pastor Jeff is going to tell us about some others who, man, they got the surprise of a lifetime on their walk that day. Even though Jesus had told them that he would die and be raised to life again, when it actually happened, it was too surprising for them to even believe. But he appeared to them and he showed them and many others that he really was God who had come to live among us. So even though this year, the news that Jesus is alive doesn't surprise us so many years after that first Easter, we can remember with those who first heard and respond like they did by worshiping God who came to rescue us.
You know, Miss Becky is right. The message of Jesus, the resurrection, was and is still today surprising. Uh, we're actually finishing a series called Surprised by Hope, and we're looking at being surprised by the resurrection and what that means. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have had this experience? I'm guessing probably most of you, where you, you met somebody, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe in the school, somebody that you met and you you sized them up pretty quick. You figured out, at least you thought you did, pretty quickly what they're all about. You kind of think, I know this person and what their story is and what they're about. And then something happens where you get to know them or there's an experience where you find out you, didn't, you had them totally wrong. You were wrong. You were, you, what you thought you knew about them was totally wrong and you, you didn't know them at all. Has that ever happened to you? When I was in college, uh, one of my football teammates in college, a uh, running back named Devin, it was a Division I transfer, and he was one of the best athletes on the team. He was a real quiet guy, and I kind of thought I knew Devin. And then his, our senior year, we had these uh, chapel services the day before our games, and for his time to share on his, uh, that chapel service, he walked up, walks up to a grand piano, no music, nothing, uh, no notes, no music, sits down and plays from memory, from ear, this piece of classical piano from Chopin. Gets up and says, you guys know me on the field, just wanted you to know this other side of me, and sits down. We were all stunned. I couldn't believe it. I thought, I had no idea. Apparently, I did not know Devin like I thought I knew him. You know, I think this is true for all of us. We all look at people and meet people and, and get to know them and based on assumptions we have, based on stories we're telling ourselves in our own head. We think we know. We live in a world where we hear about things like confirmation bias and living in an echo chamber, and we, we project what we think, what's really going on in our mind onto others and think we know them. And this is also true maybe especially true when it comes to Jesus. We all bring preloaded assumptions about who he is and what his story is about. From the church we grew up in as, as a kid to no church background at all to maybe our perceptions from social media or from a distance of what we see Christians doing and saying and how they're behaving or what, what the news reports. We've all got projections and assumptions and misconceptions that we bring and we don't see him accurately. And we want the risen Jesus to confront those assumptions. Let me, let me try to illustrate what I'm talking about uh, to you. Uh, from an, I got this example from a Bible scholar and teacher named Tim Mackey, and it really impacted me when I first saw it. So I'm going to show you an image here of Warner Salmon's most famous painting called The Head of Christ. This is painted in 1941. This is, by the way, the most mass reproduced picture of Jesus in human history. 500 million and counting copies of this painting, if you count things like calendars and magnets and things like that. There's 500 million of them, the head of Christ. Now, what do you notice about that? Painted in 1941, it's fairly recent. What do you notice about that image? Did you catch it? Jesus is a white guy. He's a white European looking dude with high cheekbones and like nearly perfect hair. Actually, could we go back to that for just a minute? It's almost like he's got a mullet. He's close to a mullet if he was just to trim the top a little bit. I don't know, but maybe not. But that's, like Jesus is clearly the projection of Warner Salmon's image of what he should be. Really? A white guy with perfect hair and high cheekbones? That's Jesus? I'm not sure that's accurate. But it's, one of the, it's, the, it's the most common picture of Jesus in human history. Now, in 2002, a group of forensic scholars and, and uh, theologians got together and they studied a dozens and dozens of skulls, I know that sounds a little weird, from the first century in Palestine in order to do a project to recreate and reproduce the face of an average Jewish man from that region in the first century. So they examined remains of people from the first century and they produced this image here. Now, not saying this is Jesus, but this is almost certainly a closer representation of what he might have looked like than Warner Salmon's uh, white Anglo-Saxon European perfect hair Jesus. Now, which let me, let me let's put these two images together side by side now, okay? Which one of these would you rather have hanging on your wall? Which one would you be more comfortable with? Maybe you're thinking, I don't want either of those creepy guys hanging on my wall. Thank you very much, and that would be understandable. Here's the point, though. The point is, we all have spiritual blind spots. We all have them, when it comes, especially when it comes to seeing Jesus. And I don't just mean what he physically looked like. I mean who he truly is. Why, why is it that there's 500 million of Warner Salmon's European Jesus? I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that other guy, there's not going to be 500 million of those floating around. But it's a closer representation. It illustrates the point. The question is then, what does it take how do we have our blinders removed to truly see him 
as he really is. The story we're going to look at from Luke 24 really is an answer to that question. It's a an amazing story that answers the question about how we get our spiritual blinders taken off so we can see the risen Jesus as he truly is. Because the truth is you can read the Bible and you can go to church and you can be around Christians and you can do Christian stuff for years and still be blind to who he truly is. I see that happening. It's true for some of you perhaps or people that you know. The risen Jesus wants to challenge your preloaded assumptions about him. He wants to take the blinders off of all of us. You know, we're living in a time when many of the things that we thought were solid and we could count on are being challenged, are being rethought, are feeling shaky. And that's not all bad, actually. But I think it's, we're asking the question, I'm asking the question, where do you go to find out accurate information in the world today, particularly as it relates to the coronavirus? Is it, is it CNN? Is it Fox News? Is it MSNBC? Is it the Wall Street Journal? Is it the New York Times? Is it the Chicago Tribune? Well, is it, is it the CDC? Is it the World Health Organization? Is it what my friend posts on Facebook? Where do you turn? And I'm not sure I have the perfect answer to that. But where do we turn if we want to know the truth about who Jesus is? Where do we look? This story in Luke 24 is the perfect place. Let me give you a little context here. What we're going to read happens after the empty tomb. It happens after the, the women who Miss Becky mentioned have run to the tomb on the morning of the third day uh, and they find it empty to their surprise and shock. And this is the encounter where the angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And they're confused and they can't believe it. And then Peter and John come and find it empty. And so there's rumors spreading around that he may have risen. But all they know right now is that the tomb is empty. I'm going to read from Luke 24, verses 13 through 16, this remarkable story. We'll take it in, in chunks. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. There it is. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They couldn't see him. Now, they saw the man was with them, a physical man, but they didn't see who he was. That's the condition of so many of us. So these two disciples, now these are not disciples that mean the 12. These are other disciples. And by the way, if you didn't know this, Jesus had the 12 close friends, disciples, and then he had a whole bunch of dozens and dozens of other followers at this time. These are among those two guys that were part of the, gr the larger group that followed Jesus. Now, they're walking along the road and they're talking. What are they talking about? Well, what would you be talking about? Think about, let me give you a little background here. You've just given up everything to follow this guy, Jesus. You're convinced that he's the Messiah, the, the, the one who God would use to, to deliver his people, Israel. And he's gathering a following Crowds are gathering wherever he goes. He's doing amazing miracles. There's a great buzz about him. And you go to Jerusalem, uh, the holy city, and the people are shouting and cheering and hailing him as the true king. And you're, you're thinking, this is it. It's going to happen. This is the moment. Uh, the stuff is about to go down, and we have a front row seat to see God's deliverer in person. And then in a week, in just a week's time, he gets himself killed by Rome. Brutally executed. And so apparently two guys that were part of this larger group think, we are so over this. I mean, we're out. We're, we're not hanging around Jerusalem. And so they're going back home to a town called Emmaus. And they're walking. And who comes up alongside them? Jesus, the risen Jesus. Now, what I want to just pause and say is, you know, for every single one of Jesus' followers... The crucifixion was a devastating defeat and disappointment. Nobody initially saw that as a good thing. We call it Good Friday, but that's only looking back. In that moment, they all saw it as a crushing defeat. And so these two were just like, we're, it's over. We were wrong. He's not the one. We're going home. We're going back to our old life. Because the crucifixion, the death of the Messiah, just didn't fit with the story in their heads. This fit none of their assumptions. This broke all of their categories. It made no sense. And then who comes alongside them? The risen Jesus, walking up to them. Now, 
it's not only possible, but it's common for people. It's always been the case that you can be close to Jesus, alongside him even, and yet not see him. It's been true for me at times, true for you as well, I'm sure. They see, but they cannot see. So I want to just point this out. If you really want to see him, if you and if I, if we really want to see the risen Jesus for who he is, then the risen Jesus must do three things. We're going to talk about the three things. Well, actually, <laughs> frankly, the risen Jesus does all kinds of things in our lives, but three from this story that are, I think, most significant will help us take the blinders off. Um, let's, let's read on. Luke 24, verses 17 through 27. Verse 17. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who is a mighty prophet in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay, this story is so full of irony. I don't know if you catch it or not. They're walking along the road, and Jesus shows up, and they, they can't recognize him, and Jesus knows this. And he says, what does he say to them? He says, hey, what are you guys talking about? What are you talking about? What's going on? And they stop, they stand still, and they're sad. And one of them, Cleopas, we'll call him Cleo, Cleo turns to Jesus and says, are you the only dude who doesn't know what went down in Jerusalem? That's, that's my translation. And, and Jesus says, no, what things? Not only does Jesus know what went down in Jerusalem, he is what went down in Jerusalem. He, I just think this is so funny that he's, he's, he's engaging with them right at the level of their misunderstandings and misconceptions. He says, what things? Seriously, Jesus, what things? He knows what things. Now, look at what they say in response to this. This, this is really important. The story hinges on what they say right here. They totally give away their bias in this statement. They say, we were with Jesus of Nazareth, a man mighty indeed, a prophet of God. We thought he was the one to redeem Israel. They say in verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. There it is. That's the issue. That's their preloaded misconception that prevents them from seeing the risen Jesus. You've got yours, I've got mine, this is theirs. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Now here's a question. Does Jesus think that he is the one to redeem Israel? Does he believe that he has indeed redeemed Israel and the world? Yes. You see what's happening? The very thing they saw as the failure was the great victory. They just couldn't see it because it didn't fit with their categories. It didn't fit with their expectations. It didn't fit with what they had placed their hope in. Now, to understand this, we got to do a little background on this word redeem here. The word redeem, they say, he, we thought he was the one to redeem Israel. The first time that word redeem shows up in the story of the Bible is in Exodus chapter 6. This is the great Exodus story. Moses delivering God's people out of slavery in Egypt and, conquer, and, and defeating Pharaoh's army. And before he does this, God speaks to Moses in Exodus 6 verse 6. And he says, I will deliver you out of the hand of Pharaoh, out of Egypt. And with mighty acts and an outstretched arm, I will redeem you. Now, if you know the story in the Old Testament, you know what that means. If you don't, you go watch the Prince of Egypt movie and you can see, right? It's the plagues. It's the deliverance. It's the Passover lamb. It's the parting of the Red Sea. It's destroying Pharaoh and his army and delivering God's people out of bondage. So here's the point. To the Jewish mind, redeem meant deliverance out of. It meant rescue. It meant conquering God's enemies and delivering God's people. So we, let's give these guys some credit, Cleo and his friend, right? All they saw was the one they put their hopes in gets crucified. And they, 
This is not redemption. This is not delivering God's people and conquering God's enemies. Right. So in the Old Testament, who are the enemies? Egypt, Pharaoh. In the first century Palestine, who are the enemies that God needs to redeem his people from? Not Pharaoh, but Caesar. Not Egypt, but Rome. It, it makes sense why they would give up. Because the one they put their hope in didn't tromp on Caesar. He got tromped by Caesar. He's crucified by Rome. You see what's happening? But we had hoped. Friends, I don't know what you place your hope in. Sometimes we think it's Jesus, but it's actually what we expect him to do for us. We look around the world and we think, I don't understand how a God of love isn't doing this. I don't understand how if God's good, this is happening to my family, to my job, to the people that I care about. I, I, I had hoped that. How would you finish the sentence? It's in their way and they can't see who he really is. But Jesus isn't going to leave them there. So this is the first thing. Uh, I forgot to tell you three things, right? The first thing is he confronts you. He wants to confront you right at the level of your assumptions and preloaded misconceptions about him. He's confronting them. That's why he says, what are you talking about? What things? Tell me about them. And they do. And the second thing Jesus wants to do comes when he says to them, it is, and he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. And then in verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the first thing he wants to do is confront you. The second thing he wants to do is teach you. He wants to teach you about who he really is. That's how he confronts. He confronts you at your assumptions, and then he wants to teach you the truth about who he is. Oh, to be a fly on the, well, he can't be on the wall, they're on the road. So to be a fly buzzing around the road as those disciples walked with him. Can you imagine? I've often wondered, like, if I could, go, if I could insert myself into any story of the, in the Gospels or the Old or New Testament, it might be this one. To walk that seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus and listen to Jesus. How long does it take to walk seven miles? A couple of hours? And just listen to Jesus explain how everything, everything points to him. How it all had to be this way. What a walk that must have been. Let me talk to you about what it means to have Jesus as your teacher for just a minute. Part of having the blinders removed is to let Jesus be our teacher, to let him teach us. There's a lot of teachers in the world today. We're getting our information and instruction about life in all kinds of places, all kinds of wrong-headed places. What does it mean to let Jesus be your instructor, your teacher in life? You see, the new Exodus moment for them, doesn't involve Jesus killing Romans. It involves him getting killed by Romans. How does that make sense? He has to teach us about that. He has to teach them. He walks them through the scriptures. If you're serious about having Jesus as your teacher, it means that he is going to do things that are going to upset you. He's going to say things that are going to confuse you. He's going to say and do things that are going to confound you, that aren't going to make sense to you. Now, not all of the time, but a lot of the time. Take the Gospels, for example. Go and read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just take note of all the places where Jesus says things and the disciples go, yep, that totally makes sense. I saw that coming. That, I totally get that. It almost never happens. You know what happens? Every time they're, they're scratching their head, they're going, and sometimes they're even saying, don't say that stuff, Jesus. They're trying to correct him. They think they know, like we do. So if you're never confused, if you're never upset, if you're never confounded or disturbed by the things that Jesus says and does or doesn't say and doesn't do, then maybe he's not really your teacher. I've been asking myself that question. Can I let myself be confused and upset by Jesus? I want a God that sometimes challenges me, and that's going to mean that he's going to say things that I don't get because he's bigger than I am, and he's bigger than you are. Jesus says things like, you must lose your life. You must sell all your possessions. You must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. You must die to yourself. You must become a slave. You must turn the other cheek. You must be the last. You must give up your rights. Can I just tell you, all of that is terrible advice if Jesus did not rise from the grave. If he isn't risen, that's, a, that's bad advice. It's going to get you hurt. It's going to get you taken advantage of in the world. It's going to get you abused. But if he is risen, it's a game changer. It means you see the world differently. And he wants to teach you about that. Yet, 
even after all this teaching. So they walk along the road for the seven-mile journey, and Jesus is explaining to them all the law and the prophets, how it all points to him. Yet even still they don't see. I wonder, how is that? How is it that they don't see? Jesus tells us why not. Because in verse 24, he says, you're slow of heart to believe. It doesn't say, you, it doesn't say you're, you're dim-witted or you're dumb up here. It says that they're slow of heart. Here's the thing. What those disciples needed was not new information. They knew the stories, backwards and forwards, from their youth. What many of you need is not new information. You know the story, but your heart isn't open. Our heart isn't open to him, and so we don't see. There's a great connection between our heart and our spiritual eyes. The the Apostle Paul in Ephesians says he prays for the Ephesian church that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened, be opened. Later, we're going to read about their hearts burning within them. There's a connection there. Jesus says you don't see not because you don't know information. It's because your heart isn't open. And that's what he wants to do here and address them at this level. Let me read the last part of the story, verses 28 through 33. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther. See, Jesus is he's messing with them. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. (laughs) This is so, so great. Jesus acts like he's going farther. Can you see it in your mind's eye, the, the story? They're walking on the road. He's teaching them. They're enthralled with his teaching, but they still don't know who he is. And they come to their house. It's their town. They're going to veer off now. And Jesus is like, oh, okay, good to, good to hang with you. I'm going to go on further. I'm like, no, 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 come over. Please come to our house, have supper. He's like, no, no, I got to go. No, no, please, please. Okay, if you insist, I'll come over. He's, he, he's there to meet them. And he goes to their house. And it says that they invited him into their home. That's significant. They invited him into their home, into their, and he sits down at their table. This is really important for you to get. If you want to have the blinders taken off, you can't stand at a distance and examine Jesus like he's, he's a subject you're mastering. You must invite him in. You must invite him into the center of your life. That's what the home and the table symbolize to the Jewish mind, into the very center, the heart, the core of who you are. You invite him in. Now notice, they don't see him yet, which means they don't fully understand all there is to know about him yet, but they can still invite him in. Some of you I know, and I've been this way, and I've talked to people that are this way, they think, I gotta get my questions answered first. I gotta get it all sorted out in my mind. I, I, I have issues, I have questions, I have doubts, and once I can answer all my objections, then I can decide if I'm gonna do this Jesus thing or not. It doesn't work that way. You can think yourself only so far, and at some point, I think you have to come to the place where you say, look, Jesus, I don't know everything, but I'm inviting you in to be my teacher. I'm inviting you into my life to confront me and to instruct me and last, to redeem you. Let's go back to that word redeem. To redeem you. To do for you what he came to do. When does the penny drop for these guys? For Cleo and his friend. When do they get it? When does it just click for them? They figure out who he is. Jesus, who is a guest, comes into their house and he's the one who takes the bread. What does this text say? He takes bread, he gives thanks, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them, and their eyes are opened. Anybody? Does that sound familiar to you? Just flip back two chapters. Just two days ago, we took bread right here in this very spot. I took bread, broke it, and led many of us through communion. What's he doing? Reminding them, showing them, explaining to them, not just with instruction on the road, but with the tangible symbols he's given us of what his death and resurrection really means. The word redeem literally means to buy back, like a ransom payment, to purchase out of. This is not the redemption they were looking for, but it is the redemption they needed. And it's the one you need and I need and Jesus gives. 
It was not until Jesus came in the very center of their lives that they got it, that they saw him. I just want to ask you, what preloaded assumptions do you have? What expectations and disappointments do you carry with you? Because of the resurrection and the empty tomb, Jesus is greater than your assumptions, than your disappointments, than your expectations, than your failures, than your hurts, than your brokenness, than your regrets. He's greater than all of it because he's risen. For so many of us, it's not new information we need. We have the information. It's to open our hearts. I've been praying about this all week that maybe for some of you watching right now, this is the moment. You're in your home, you're on your couch, you're in your chair, at your table. This is your moment to humble yourself and to invite Jesus into your heart. He'll come in, just as he did in this story. He'll come in and he'll confront you at times, he'll teach you, and ultimately he will redeem you. Would you welcome him? Maybe you look back and say, it was in the year of the, of the coronavirus crisis in my own home when I opened my heart and let the risen Jesus in. And I've never been the same. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are a risen king and we confess that we've got all kinds of assumptions and all kinds of misconceptions that get in our way. We think we know, we think we see, but we don't. And we want desperately to have our blinders removed, to see you as you really are. And we acknowledge that sometimes that's going to mean we're going to be challenged and confronted and upset. But we also know that it's far better to have the real you than some made-up version in our heads. And so, Jesus, for, for those who are watching right now, who know about you, but they've never opened up and invited you in, I pray this is their moment. That right now, in this moment, in their home, through this screen, you would come into their heart, confront them, teach them, heal, restore, and redeem their life. And they will never be the same. We pray it in your name. Amen.